that FDR he sounds like like Obama right now. Was helping to save. Sounds like a liberal college professor being like, "Okay, okay, you're right, you're right." The current system. Otherwise, what's the point? He was. Yeah, that's what. That's what. Like Marx, Leninists uh, that believe uh, in in you know revolutionary action see the welfare state as counterproductive. They think that the welfare state is offering a level of comfort to the workers that sedates them Absolutely. and helps them think uh, like the SDP did in... Uh... No, they don't. Where is this coming from? Which Marxist-Leninists are you talking about? Maybe like third worldists? Yeah, where'd you get this idea that Marxist-Leninists are opposed to the welfare state? Like, what the fuck are you talking about? Who, who is he referring to? Pretty sure the Communist Party supported all progressive reforms and was actually behind them like leading you know like i don't know what he's talking about Man, this is like new left shit like uh the workers are all ernest talman what what does that have to do with it do you think wait are you talking about the third period against the spd you think that was because they didn't like reforms no it was because the fucking spd was actually a counter-revolutionary force that was circumventing the bourgeois democratic freedoms to crack down on communists. It wasn't because Marxist Leninists had an issue with uh, the welfare state or the ideas of the social democrats. It was because what the social democrats were doing at the time, right? They were actually collaborating with the reactionary ruling class actively at the time. And it's not like they were knocking on an open door and were saying, like, Bernie's a fascist, Bernie's. A no, dude. You need to fucking read history. This is so stupid. Uh, you know, in, in Germany, uh, in the pre-Nazi Germany, uh, that they, they feel like they have a seat at the table, they have a crumb of power, and they're... What? The SPD was barely in power. The SPD was barely in power. You f Like, what are you fucking talking about? Seeing, like, genuine... Do you think it went from SPD to the Nazis? Because that's not what happened. In material changes, no matter how fucking tiny it is. So they just uh, no longer want to fight back in, in the way that true... Okay, the idea that reform should be opposed because they have a pacifying effect on the workers is just the most outlandish... That's coming from like the 60s, 70s New Left. That's not something Marxist Leninists ever said. They never, that's just stupid. Marxist Leninists don't care if, like, how oh, the reforms are pacifying people. Well, no, that's not, that wasn't the communist perspective. The communist perspective was that the Social Democrats would fail in being able to deliver uh, these reforms. Now, after World War II, maybe there's a different story. Like, how should Marxist Leninists, uh, deal with but the strategy marxist Leninists took after world war ii was to be a defensive popular front force like we want to defend these gains of the working class we want to be a van that's what the that's the role the french communist party would take now the new left would come around and they would have your kind of criticism of what you're saying like oh these reforms and these communist the communist party is a sellout these reforms are just pacifying the people but that was like the May 68 new left that was like third worldist and culminated in the left we see today. You know, you got to get your history right, Hassan. This is really stupid. Truly, uh, in the ways that where you can truly change uh, the way that we organize our society. That's a really legitimate and interesting critique. And, you know, and it depends on what you mean by welfare state. So if you're talking about food stamps, that's even more true. But then how brutal are you going to be in denying that? to try to hope for a revolution, right? Yeah, no, I, I am not an accelerationist anyway. I don't think that we will ever accelerate uh, towards a fucking Marxist-Leninist revolution. The material... Yeah. <laughs> Why does Hassan love the word Marxist-Leninist? Can I teach you guys a little something-something about Marxism-Leninism? So it's a funny word. Isn't Marxism-Leninism a funny word? It's like Marxism and also Leninism. What's the point of this word? I'll tell you why. So before Lenin, you had a you had you said something called Orthodox Marxism. So Marxism all across the world and Europe was 
the second international, and it was called the Social Democrats before World War I. And they created something called Orthodox Marxism, a way of simplifying Marxism to make it accessible to stupid people. Make it accessible to the masses. Orthodox Marxism. Simplify it, not only for the masses, but for the operational, like, how do you start a party? How do you get the... It's like a, an orthodoxy that's supposed to be practical, right? Now, Stalin made a point of saying that Lenin had a unique contribution and that Lenin wasn't just an orthodox Marxist. Lenin wasn't just a Marxist. Lenin represented something new, right? And so he called it Leninism. And he, he tried to integrate Lenin's contribution with Marxism in the form of Marxism-Leninism. But you have to ask the question, the very fact that Marxism was not adequate enough and it needed Lenin and Lenin's contribution says something about Marxism in general. The, whole, the point is not to turn Marxism-Leninism into a dogma. The whole point of Marxism-Leninism is that the original dogma doesn't work. It doesn't satisfy the development of reality. That's why Marxism-Leninism leads to Mao and Mao Zedong thought and all this other stuff. Marxism-Leninism is the launching pad. It's not the end point. It's the launching pad of true Marxism, right? You need to understand that. It's not a dogma. It's not a dogma. It's a, uh, it's a way of cataloging real historical experiences. So I, I don't know what Hassan's saying. I don't... The Marxist-Leninist revolution. There's no such thing as a Marxist-Leninist revolution. There's revolutions, and they can be leaders of revolutions who have learned from the experience of Lenin and Marx, who have things to say about how revolutions work. But no revolution is premised on the basis of an ideology called Marxism-Leninism. Yeah. Conditions are not there. That's think... not what Marxist-Leninists believe. They don't believe there's going to be a Marxist-Leninist revolution. They believe there's going to be a revolution and that Marxism-Leninism is the best guide to being able to navigate and lead this revolution, right? That, like, that's an outdated way of thinking. We don't even have any sort of organizational power. And Marxism-Leninism is outdated, and yet you believe in 17th century liberal metaphysics? Get the fuck out of here, son. Commodity production and the way it's done now... Uh, especially in the Western world, when it's so far removed from the assembly, when the labor aristocracy is so far removed from the assembly line, <laughs> what? That like it's just not going to happen. Our our uh, our labor force has been pussified, if you will. No, we have a we have a tough labor force. Uh, we do have pussified Netflix employees who you call the vanguard of the working class, but. I think this is just projection. Uh, and, and no longer, like, is actually fucking working in the factory. So... This... How... Please explain the connection to Marxism, someone. It makes it much, much, much more difficult to actually organize because you're working... No, it, it makes... It's way easier to organize today. We have the fucking internet. Are you kidding? The fuck? It's way easier, dude. It's become more socialized than before. It's not less, it's more. Yeah, people aren't working on an assembly line, but they're getting all of their information and sense of social belonging Porcelain donated six in very five. centralized spaces. Five. White collar jobs for the most part. Right. But there are things that could lead to structural and institutional change that are part of the quote unquote welfare. Oh, state. also the other part is we, this is actually a brilliant take from Murat. You'll enjoy this. Murat always talks about the bread price. He says, no matter where you go in America, the price of bread is stable and it's cheap. And he's 100% right. He's like, as long as that bread price is the same and people at the very, like, the people that have the most revolutionary potential are still able to Love feed themselves, exchange. which Americans can, by the way, no matter how poor they are and no matter how much like medical bankruptcy exists and it's kind of weird that he says this in the midst of a supply chain crisis with a very high near future likelihood of food prices like rapidly rising coupled with inflation. So, uh, dude, Hassan, very bad timing to say this, to say the least. And whatnot, and no matter how much cruelty 
and oppression we subject uh, the working class here in America to ultimately is... Okay, I need to clarify this to people. Revolutions don't happen because of how brutal and cruel things are. They happen because there's a disconnect between expectations for what the future should be and the passage of time. When people have an expectation of where they should be at and they fall below that expectation and where that is is relative based on the country. Let's say everyone had a yacht in America. Even if everyone had a yacht, it doesn't matter. You have an expectation and if you fall below the expectation of what you're entitled to, you feel you're entitled to, that's the source of revolutionary fervor. I need people to understand, and I hate to break this to all of you LARPers in the chat who think revolutions are when the oppressed rise up because they're being oppressed. But people have been always depressed, dude. People have shit kicked in their face and dirt kicked in their face for hundreds of years and nothing happens. Oppression is something that always happens. Revolutions don't happen when the oppressed rise up. Revolutions happen when the privileged rise up. The privileged get butt hurt because they're entitled, and they're the ones who lead revolutions. What happens, though, is that this happens in the cities. Then people in the countryside go, hey, if they're entitled to that, I'm entitled too. And that's when the oppressed become mobilized. The oppressed never become mobilized based on slave morality. Like, I'm oppressed and you're an oppressor, I should rise up. No, the oppressed rise up when they suddenly feel entitled. The French Revolution was led by the Third Estate. The Third Estate, at first, was the most entitled and privileged of the bourgeoisie, the, the bourgeois of the cities, who thought they were like these snarky people, like, oh, oh, yeah. These nobles and aristocrats and this king is giving too much power to the peasants. I want to, you know what I mean? Like, it was almost like they were reactionaries. Thank you, radical leftists of Jenna. So they rose up, but then when that happened, the, the others followed and the rest is history, right? But re revolutions aren't started in a progressive way at all. They're started by the most privileged and entitled popular strata of society. Every rev give me one exception to this. Every revolution in history is started by the privileged and the entitled. And there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. But that's how they start. Sp the Spartacus uprising was probably started by like the most well-off slaves. The Haitian revolution. I don't have too much knowledge on it. So I couldn't tell you. But I would not be surprised if the Haitian revolution began with the most privileged strata of slaves in some capacity, whether in the form of its leaders, original leaders, or whatever. Now, I'll admit later on it became different, but it would not surprise me if that's how it started. As long as they can fucking buy bread and eat bread, and bread is an analogy here for food for the most part, they... Petite Blancs and the poor slaves. ...will never fucking rise up and... and like, you guys know Tahrir Square in Egypt? That wasn't started by the poor. The poor voted for the Muslim Brotherhood. The Tahrir Square was started by a middle class that had expectations that were not realized. Okay? And engage in labor militancy or have any sort of, like, violent, bloody revolution. No, the more... I Same is true for the Iranian, Iranian Revolution. The Iranian Revolution was uh, privileged students in the cities rose up against the Shah... And then the countryside rose up and they were like, oh shit, we didn't mean it all like that, right? <laughs> That's every revolution, every revolution in history. First, these city dwellers caused commotion. We want revolution, we want revolution. And then people in the city be like, okay, we want revolution. People in the countryside go, we want revolution too. So they march the hordes of people from the countryside. And then the city dwellers are like, oh shit, we didn't mean it like that. We didn't mean all that. Right? And then they become the counter-revolutionaries. That's always the law of revolution. It's always how it happens. Every single one in history. Every single one in history. A theory on bread is excellent. Uh, and is you'll see it play out in milk a lot. Uh, where they'll actually have a lot of news stories about the price of milk. Uh, and so, and it happened recently too. Uh, but, you know, like, in a sense, uh, Obama is the political version of that. You just do a little release valve. Right. Now, right now in America, see, Occupy Wall Street was these privileged hipster fucks. But
but I supported Occupy Wall Street. Now in America, we are in the age of populism. So the countryside is rising up and these urban fucks who, who used to be the first revolutionaries with Occupy Wall Street, whatever, they've become the counter-revolutionaries. So you see what's going on? They've become the counter-revolutionaries. And the countryside rose up. And they're like, oh, we didn't mean all that. Remember in Occupy Wall Street? Down with the 1%. Down with the 1%. Then, <laughs> the you know, American people are now in New York. Black Lives Matter. All of them are uniting against the government, against the vaccine mandates. And they're like, oh, we didn't mean it like that. No, no, I mean, look, we were advocating for revolution. It's like, hey, 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 no, 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 we didn't mean it like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, they talk about, we want to strike. Netflix on strike. Netflix on strike. Then there's talk of a general strike. No, 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 we didn't mean it like that. We didn't mean it like that. No, 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 that's not what we meant. Yeah, um, that's, I, that's why I think, like, the revolutionary potential only exists in the third world, if we're being real. If we're being really real, the only places where there's, like, actual revolutionary potential is the third world. It's the exploited people, because here in the United States, whether this is the dumbest shit I've ever heard. What is this? Yeah, stop talking about the third worldism and all this shit. The third world have their own thing going on. There's reformists in the third world. There's like you don't know what the you don't know what you're talking about. Shut up about that shit, dude. All the same social dynamics exist in the third world too. You have the PMCs there. The same shit goes on in third world. They're not different. It's just relative difference of wealth, yes. Different standard of living, yes. But it's not, you don't get a get out of jail pass free by just talking about the third world and you solve all the issues that you have here.